Hello and welcome to Bun Med, where we discuss concise medical knowledge that you can fit inside of a bun. In this video, we're going to be having a look at jaundice, specifically what jaundice is, the mechanisms by which jaundice may come about, and also a little bit about what to ask for a patient with jaundice and how to um, go about assessing them. So with that said, let's have a look at what jaundice is. Jaundice refers to a yellow discoloration of one's skin due to an excess buildup of bilirubin in our blood. Now, although I say an excessive buildup of bilirubin, jaundice only becomes clinically visible when the levels of bilirubin reach about two to three times the upper limit of normal. This bilirubin can get, then get deposited in areas on our body, such as the whites of our eyes, giving us scleral icterus, sclera referring to the whites of the eyes and icterus referring to a yellowing, or the palms of our hands and feet. Now that we understand the basics of what jaundice is, let's actually have a look at the mechanisms by which jaundice arises. In order for us to understand how jaundice comes about, we need to understand a bit about bilirubin metabolism. But before we get into that, let me just orient you with this simplistic diagram. In red here, you can see we have our circulation. Then we have our liver, our bile duct, and then our small intestines. Now let's go back to bilirubin. Where does bilirubin actually come from? Well, bilirubin is a breakdown product of hemoglobin, and we know that hemoglobin is found inside of our red blood cells. At the end of the 120 days a red blood cell has in its life cycle, it will make its way to the spleen to be broken down into unconjugated bilirubin. Now, there's an issue with unconjugated bilirubin and that, that it's insoluble. However, we do need to remove bilirubin from our blood as high levels of it can potentially be toxic. And as such, what we do is we bind the unconjugated bilirubin to a protein known as albumin. This bilirubin albumin complex then makes its way to the liver, where it is uptaken by hepatocytes and conjugated by an enzyme known as UDP glucuronal transferase. Essentially, in this process, the enzyme helps to convert unconjugated bilirubin into conjugated or soluble bilirubin. This conjugated and soluble bilirubin can now be released into our bile ducts, where it will make its way into our small intestines, or it may sit around for a little bit of time in our gallbladder. In our small intestines, it will be acted on by gut bacteria, where often it will be broken down into the breakdown product of conjugated bilirubin, which is urobilinogen. About 90% of this urobilinogen will be converted into another compound known as stercobilinogen, which is often the pigment that gives feces its color. So this is the main way that we get rid of bilirubin in our feces, um, where 90% of the bilirubin that's broken down will end up in our feces. Around 10% of the urobilinogen, however, will be actively reabsorbed inside of our gut into the blood, where it may then be excreted via our renal system. Now that we understand the mechanisms of bilirubin breakdown, let's have a look at the mechanisms by which there might be a buildup of bilirubin. We can actually break this down into three categories. Prehepatic, or before it reaches the liver. Hepatic, where we have an issue with the liver leading to a buildup of bilirubin. Or posthepatic, where there's some kind of issue with our bile ducts leading to a buildup of bilirubin. In prehepatic causes, our bilirubin is building up because uh, there's an excessive amount of bilirubin being produced. And thus, we have exceeded our liver's ability to take in this bilirubin and conjugate it. A great example of something like this is hemolysis, where we have an excessive breakdown of red blood cells, thus making more and more bilirubin. The bilirubin made can therefore exceed the liver's ability to conjugate it, and therefore we have a buildup of unconjugated bilirubin in our blood. And because we're having a breakdown of our red blood cells, of course we're going to get features of anemia. Now it's important to realize that our hepatocytes at this point are in absolute hyperdrive, trying to conjugate as much bilirubin as physically possible. And as such, we're going to get even more urobilinogen being produced than we would have done in a normal state. And thus, more urobilinogen will be reabsorbed into our body. This urobilinogen can then end up in our urine, make, giving us a dark urine. 
And this is often one of the earlier features of something like jaundice or uh, hemolysis going on, is we have dark urine. Another cause of jaundice, a uh, kind of prehepatic, is something known as Gilbert syndrome, where we have a partial deficiency of the enzyme UDP uh, glucuronyl transferase. And essentially, in this case, what happens is because we have a partial deficiency, if we have uh, times of stress, such as an infection or after a night out having drunk quite a lot of alcohol, um, we get a buildup of excessive uh, unconjugated bilirubin as, once again, we have exceeded our liver's ability to conjugate the bilirubin. So let's just get rid, on, uh, rid of this and clear the screen for the time being. In terms of hepatic causes, we have direct insult to the liver or the hepatocytes themselves. Causes of hepatic jaundice include things like alcoholic liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, viral hepatitis, and also autoimmune hepatitis and drug-induced hepatitis. All of these attack the hepatocytes themselves, which can then die and re release all of their conjugated bilirubin inside of our bloodstreams. When it comes to post-hepatic jaundice, we're looking at some things obstructing our biliary tree. Things that may do this is things like common bile duct stones or cholidocolithiases, a tumour pressing on our bile duct, such as the case of a cholangiocarcinoma or a head of pancreatic cancer. And this one is very special to look out for in elderly people who may have a painless jaundice. Things such as primary sclerosing cholangiitis, an autoimmune condition which leads to fibrosis of our uh, bile duct, can also cause narrowing of our bile duct. And the common theme here is that all three of these uh, things that we have talked about stops the flow of bile directly from here, from the bile ducts into our small intestine. So we get a buildup of bile. This bile can then backflow along the liver and literally the unconjugated bilirubin will force its way back into our, sorry, conjugated bilirubin will force its way into our blood vessels, giving us jaundice. Now that we've also discussed how we may get post-hepatic jaundice, it's important to realize that because the bile is not escaping, it's not being able to make its way into our small intestines. And as such, we're not going to get bile um, being able to break down the fats in our small intestines. So often what you might see is very foul uh, smelling stools or pale stools known as steatorrhea and dark urine as we're also getting urobilinogen being reabsorbed back into the blood. So now that we've talked about the mechanisms by which jaundice comes about, how might we assess a patient with jaundice? Well, in this case, it's very, very important to ask a few questions in the history. Firstly, things like acute, uh, is the uh, jaundice acute or chronic, or the onset and duration of the jaundice? As often an acute jaundice might give you uh, something like a picture of acute liver failure, where or they have chronic liver failure and they've acutely decompensated. Things such as the presence of pain, because often things like right upper quadrant pain, along with other features such as fever um, and jaundice, uh, can give you a picture of ascending cholangiitis, which could be an emergency. Things such as changes to our urine and stool, are they getting pale stools or dark urine, could give us an idea that we may have post-hepatic jaundice. Do they have any weight loss, especially if it's painless weight loss, painless jaundice and weight loss, this might uh, point to the direction of a pancreatic cancer. Are they having vomiting of blood or hematemesis? And this, this may occur in things such as chronic liver disease, where they have portal hypertension and uh, esophageal varices leading to bleeding. Now, I know I've just thrown out a lot of terms there. Don't worry, um, I will make a video talking about chronic liver disease in itself and its manifestations. Things such as fevers and rigors. This is another red flag because if they have a fever and rigor along with jaundice, this may present to the direction of something uh, such as ascending cholangitis, which is again an emergency as it can lead to sepsis. Things like joint pains. Often in autoimmune jaundice, you get joint pains. When we're actually examining the patients, it's important to have a look from the end of the bed and also assess the patient's mental state, specifically if they have an altered mental state such as drowsiness as this could point to the direction of hepatic encephalopathy, which is essentially a acutely failing liver, leading to a buildup of metabolic waste and an altered mental state. 
This is especially dangerous as it can lead to things like coma or even death. It's important to look in the eyes to look for subconjunctival pallor, as this may show us in hemolytic anemia. Kaiser Fleischer rings. This is a, a metabolic condition where we can't remove a copper from our blood, leading to a buildup of copper and chronic liver disease, essentially. Again, I'll go into this more, in more detail in another video. Not hugely. Things such as xanthelasma, do they have a buildup of uh, this yellow cholesterol around their eyes? Okay. What do their breath smell like? Is there any alcohol in their breath? This might point to the direction of alcohol abuse or something such as um, acute uh, liver disease, uh, sorry, chronic liver disease. Uh, uh, fat or hepaticus, this awful rancid smell of rotten eggs and garlic, which comes about from acute liver failure. Over their chest, do they have things like spider nevi? or gynecomastia, or loss of axillary hair. All of these points to the direction of chronic liver disease, as you're not being able to break down estrogen, so estrogen causes the spider nevi, uh, enlargement of breast tissue in gynecomastia, and loss of axillary hair. Do they have any needle tract marks? This may point to the direction of something like uh, intravenous drug use and viral hepatitis. Are they bruising spontaneously? This is very, very dangerous, as this means that the liver can no longer produce uh, clotting factors that it needs to produce. Do they have any clubbing, palmar erythema, or dubatrine's contractures? As this points to the direction of a, a chronic liver disease. Or a flapping tremor, it's a red flag because this points to the direction of, again, hepatic encephalitis. Over their abdomen, do they have hepatomegaly? Do they have a large tender liver? Do they have any ascites or abdominal distension? Or even caput medusae, which is this distension of the veins over our abdomen that kind of looks like Medusa's head. That concludes the video. Hope you guys found it useful. Please feel free to share and subscribe. And if you have any comments, leave them below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. See you in the next one.